There was a man standing before a judge in California for shooting a condor. This is a protected bird, and people who kill them must pay the consequences. The man pleaded with the judge by saying, I just arrived in the state, and I've never seen a bird that large before. I was hungry and could not help myself to shoot and eat it. The judge said, I forgive you. Just don't let it happen again. The man replied, yes, sir. The judge, curious about the bird, asked the man, how did it taste? The man replied, I guess somewhere between a whooping crane and a spotted owl. <laughs> Nothing to do with the message this morning. <laughs> All right, last week, if you were here, what was the message about? What was sitting here where these people are now? Well, the tabernacle. It wasn't the tabernacle, right? It was a very crude representation. If you weren't here last week, we had tables on their side to be the walls, and yeah, and we had some other crude things. But anyways, we went through the different aspects, some of the different things that were in the, it wasn't the whole tabernacle totally, it was mostly the holy place and the most holy place. And we, because in Hebrews, which is where we've been, if you haven't been with us, for some of you, you haven't for sure, from Word of Life, we've been in the book of Hebrews, and we're now in chapter 9, and in the first part of chapter 9, it lists all the different elements that are in the holy place, and most holy place, and so we describe them and how they relate to Christ, and just showing the relevancy of the whole Bible, and especially the relevancy of everything from the Old Testament and the rituals and stuff, and, and what, how it pointed to Jesus himself. And we've been talking all through the book of Hebrews how Jesus is actually the fulfillment and the, the one who actually completed it so that now we don't have to do that because now we have Jesus. Now, when we've been talking about what is our theme in the book of Hebrews, I heard it somewhere, make much of Jesus because Hebrews keeps over and over explaining. We say some of it, we keep saying some of it over and over again because it keeps telling us different character qualities and different things that, did, that Jesus did and what applies to him to make us see the superiority of him to everything else. And for sure, it was written to who? Or we could say it was written to what group of people? Oh, isn't that interesting? Yes, it was written to Hebrews, the Jews, right? To show them that this Jesus was who? primarily the messiah right and so it says he's he's greater than moses he's greater than abraham he's greater than the prophets he's greater than angels jesus is one in himself because he is the only one who was a hundred percent god so we come into this week um in verse 5, uh, 11 is where we'll pick up in the chapter 9 if you'd like to turn there and so I, I have a, something I brought with me to help illustrate where we're at. So when you, when you go to a lot of the pagans, so we're talking about the ritualistic and, and the, the sacrifices that happened in the Jewish religion, right? The Old Testament, they were sacrificing over and over and over and over again. And, but you know what? It happened in other religions too, right? In the old days. When I, I went to a Mayan ruins, anybody ever been to a Mayan ruin? Nobody here? Okay. Anyways, I have been. It was in Honduras, and, and they had a big platform. That was a while ago, but let's say 10, 15 feet. I know it's not very accurate, but in that range somewhere, up in the air, and there were stairs, or there was stones like stairs coming up from all four directions but on that platform they would do sacrifices and then off the side they had this this um stone it was all everything was made out of stone that's why it's still there right but there was this place that was like let's say the width right here pretty close this was grass where everybody is here and then on each side there was like a cement but well, it wasn't cement but stone that went like at an angle you could stand on it, and then it was on this side, an angle of stone that was like this, okay? Got any visual with me at all? Michelle says, no, I don't have a clue where you are. Okay, this is grass, okay? Can we get that? 
Is that simple enough? What are you? <laughs> Pretty poor looking, too. You need some fertilizer. No. <laughs> so on this side, though, it elevates about this. Well, maybe it was this high, actually. I think it was more like this high. And then from there, it goes up at an angle. And then there was actually a uh, little tower in the center where they would drop out the ball or whatever it was. And so the key was they would have to they would keep putting it back and forth, and then if it landed in the center, you'd lose a point. Something like this, kind of rough and crude. Well, the winner of this game, you know, the team that won, see, somebody would get sacrificed from this game on that altar that was over there, which you could see from this, where this game was taken. It might interest you as to who is the one who gets sacrificed. It was the captain of the winning team. The captain of the winning team would then be the one that would be sacrificed over here on that altar to appease the gods. And that was such a great honor for that, for that person to be able to be a part of. I don't know, but I think I would have had a bad game that day. Just saying, if I was the captain, say, oh my, I hope my players don't play well today. But no, because if you think that's the most honorable thing you could ever do as a living being, that would be what you would want. Is that true? It's a mindset, isn't it? Always, it was about blood. It was about the shedding of blood. It was about appeasing the gods by somebody's blood being shed. Do you know what this is? Strawberry jam. Is that what somebody said? Yeah. That's what some of you would like to think it is. What's that? It's not pigs. That would be profaneable to the Jews, but not the Jews are here. Anyways, anybody here a Jew? Maybe. Okay, anyways. It is blood, and it is just a cow, because why would it be cow's blood? I'm a dairy farmer, and I have cows. Okay, there you go. That's why it is. What has happened, and I remember it being talked about a number of years ago, that people wanted to take, and if you listen to our songs, you hear it, that the blood is taken out of it. In fact, that's why you see the the name of our message this morning is a bloody religion. If you take away the blood from our religion, what do you have? Well, you have something, but what do you have? A dead religion, right? You have no power, you have no resurrection, you have no freedom. Nothing but the blood of Jesus, right? Remember that old hymn? What can wash away my sin? What can make me whole again? You guys are mumbling. You sound like you are in a pagan religion with your mantras or something. The blood matters. And I remember hearing about in Christianity how it wasn't uh, a good thing. And I had had the word, but I, I lost it. To be talking about the blood of Christ. We shouldn't be talking about blood. We shouldn't be singing about it. A lot of the songs, that's not mentioned in the newer, in the last 10, 20 years of the blood. But when it comes to biblical Christianity, if there is no blood, there is no forgiveness of sins, which is a verse that's in the passage that we have today. So, this morning, we are in uh, Hebrews chapter 9, talking about Christ himself, of course, again, because that's what Hebrews is all about. Let's pray, and then we'll get into the word this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that it is relevant still for today. And I thank you that Jesus matters, that you matter, Lord. And I thank you for the blood that you shed to pay for the price for our sins. And I pray that as we look at this this morning, it's probably not new stuff. It's similar. But Lord, you keep saying it over and over again because the Hebrews needed to hear it. And I think there's a reality that we continue to need to hear it too. So guide us this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. 
We're going to be talking about Christ this morning. You say what Christ did or the reality. We get the reality, the results, and the rewards this morning. I even alliterated it. I think um, uh, Wendell Call would be proud of me. I have an alliteration this morning. But anyways, the reality, what Christ did. And it's, uh, we're starting with verse 11. And we'll just read 11 through 14 and then uh, pick out some points. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls, uh, goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling those who had been defiled, sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit uh, offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? When I just read that, some of you understand this about Paul. That's one of the reasons I think this might be by Paul. Did you see how long that sentence was? He was known for run-on sentences, by the way. So, whether it was or not, doesn't matter. just thought I'd throw that out there. The reality, what Christ did. Look at some of the action words you say, the verbs or whatever. Christ appeared. He appeared. Do you know that Jesus appeared on planet Earth a couple thousand years ago in the form of a baby? It's not that he always has been, but at that moment in time, he appeared. What did he appear for? He appeared to save us. Of course, that was a result, right? But he appeared, both God and man. The word that was used of him in Matthew chapter 1 was what for that? That talks about him being God and man. What's the word? We sing about it at Christmas time. Emmanuel, right? God with us. God with us. So, God appeared... What else did he do? He appeared as a high priest. So he appeared as a baby, but he was grown, and he became the high priest for us. We talked about high priests a lot, so we won't belabor this too much. But a high priest basically what? Helps us to get right with God and shows and like represents God to us. He represents us to God and represents God to us. He kind of does that ministry, right? That's what a high priest does. He helps us to get closer to God. And, and, he, and he brings, like, uh, he helps us to get right with God and helps us to know God better. So he, he's a, he was appeared as a high priest. And we talked about a, the court of the um, line of, of Melchizedek, which is a whole other thing we've been talking a lot about. But look at it. But when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things to come, what was coming, he entered through the greater, more perfect tabernacle. So this is talking about when he appeared, like, glimpsed through that illustration that we used last week. We called it, for those of you who are teachers like this, an object lesson, right? It was an object lesson for them. So he's saying that Christ, even though he appeared as far as in the flesh a couple thousand years ago, he actually appeared in this object lesson 1300 or so years before that in the form of the tabernacle. But now he appears differently. Look at that and what it says here. Not made with hands, not of this creation. In other words, not something somebody put together like they did in the tabernacle, which was something visual, and it was made out of creative things, and a lot of it was made out of what? Yeah, we couldn't represent it that well, right? Because we didn't have that much gold last week. But it was made out of gold. But now Christ appears not made with hands, not of this creation. He is our great high priest from the throne room of heaven, from the tabernacle of heaven is is what we saw last week. But then, look what it says, and not through the blood of bulls and goats, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place. So he not just appeared, but he entered. Do you remember what happened the moment that Christ died on the cross? And died, the moment that his blood was shed on that cross, what happened in the temple? Veil was torn in two from top to bottom. And we talked about last week how 
that was to show them that now we can go boldly to the throne, right? We can go right straight to God himself. There was no need of the sacrifices because the one perfect sacrifice that had just happened and now cleared the way so that we could all come boldly before the throne of God. And we also talked about how in that first century, what did they do with the, with the tent? What did they do with the veil? They fixed it, cobbed it up. But did that negate what Christ had done? We can create veils in our own lives that keep us from believing and having faith in the one true God and try to do our own works to get to God, but it's not going to negate what Christ has already done. There is only one way to the Father, and that is through the Son, John 14, 6. So no matter what we do, and they, they try to cobble it back up, and that's why he's talking to them here, is because he's talking to those people who keep wanting to go back to the old system. Even though Christ has opened the way, and they have freedom, free access to the Father, they keep wanting to go back to the old system. What did he do when he entered, though? When he entered, dying on that cross, he did it how many times? Once for all. There was now no need of another sacrifice. There was no need of another. He was the fulfillment of everything needed to come to Christ. He was the once for all sacrifice that they had been longing for all those years. Do you think it would have been a lot of work for the priests to be offering sacrifices each week? I kind of picture them as kind of some buff men. They didn't have to go work out in the gym. They were working out in church. Wrestling bulls and goats all the time. And I'm not joking about that. (laughs) That would have been hard work. Butchering animals. Anybody here ever butchered an animal? So a lot of you probably have butchered deer, right? That, that's maybe a little easier. But you understand the concept. It takes work. It takes work. It's not easy work. What does he also say? He entered once for all with his own blood. He didn't take the blood of another animal. He didn't take the blood of another person. He took his own blood and gave it to us. Why? Because it was the only perfect blood that has ever existed. God in the flesh without sin, right? He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God with him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 With his own blood. What else? So I said, reality, what Christ did, he appeared, he entered, and he cleansed. For if the bulls, blood of bulls and goats and ashes of heifer sprinkling had been defiled, sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh, if that had been true, it's saying, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish, that perfect blood that was shed, what, what is it for? To cleanse your conscience. And I love the words from dead works to serve the living God. To cleanse your conscience. So in the Old Testament, remember that every time the sacrifice was done and you, shed, you, get, you get, had the blood of the, of the bull or the goat was shed, it would cover your sin. But there would still be some sort of knowledge of that sin. And I don't know if there, you could say there was still some sort of guilt and shame for the sin that you'd done because it wasn't totally taken away, it was just covered, and so you had to keep covering it. Anybody here do something wrong, and you kind of keep sweeping it on the rug, under the rug? You know the illustration, right? What happens to the rug over time? Does it clean itself out? What does it do? And what happens when it builds? A big bump. And what happens to you when you walk by it next time? So... But, So that was kind of the mosaic system. It was just like, you know, it kept covering it, but it was still there. But when Christ came and offered up his own perfect blood, it did what? It washed it clean. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be 
white as snow, cleansed by the blood of the Lamb for e eternal redemption. Without blemish, God himself. Now, why did he do it, though? Even see that here. Why did he do it? So that we could serve him. Did you catch that in the verse? Look at that. From dead works to serve the living God. I want to just mention a little bit, going back to verse 12 at the end. I kind of breezed over it, and I don't want to, because I think it's a very key point. He says that he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Redemption has the idea of this. A way to uh, define it is this. The ransom price required to free us from eternal punishment. The ransom price required to free us from eternal punishment. For example, all of us in Romans 6 talks about we're slaves of sin. That's the way you were from the time you were born. You don't have to teach a kid how to sin. He knows how to do it automatically. Is that true? Anybody here ever have children? Did you ever have to teach them to sin? You probably did a good job at teaching them to sin, but still, you didn't have to, right? We as parents, we do do a good job teaching them how to sin, but when that little baby is so innocent and so pure and so, you know, just adorable and then doesn't get his way or her way, and then they arch their back in a very loving way and shake and then cry and scream and yell. And then they get like Louie and they're still doing it at 60-something years old. But did you have to teach that kid to do that? Did that, kid, did that little baby see you on the ground? <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't ask the question. We'll, we won't go there. No, we didn't have to teach them because that's the way they came through, right? And because of that sin nature that we all have, we needed a Savior. We were a slave to sin. We needed to be redeemed. Let me say, eternal redemption. I love the word eternal because it's what? It's eternal, right? It's everlasting. It goes on forever. So in other words, when we are redeemed by Christ, it doesn't end. When we have been set free, when he buys us, in fact, as was it 1 Corinthians 6, 19, maybe it says you've been bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body, which is his. Once you accept Christ as your Savior, which is a choice that you can make, it's a decision that you can make, it's not forced onto you. You are already a slave of sin. That's just who you are. But then Romans talks about that contrast of now becoming a slave of righteousness. But that type of slave is a bondservant slave. It's a willing slave. It's saying, yes, I want to be a slave of Christ. Because I know he loves me. I know that when he died on that cross and shed his blood, it was to take my sin and make the payment for it that I couldn't make. Did you know the only way that you can pay for your sin is an eternity in hell? It's the only way. And you never can pay up because the payment for the debt of sin that we have is so great that we can never get paid off. That's the debt that Christ paid for us when he died on that cross. I love Colossians, I think it's 2, 13, and 14. Why don't we look there? Because it kind of hints towards this. You, you probably heard me say it before because I really like this passage. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled our out the certificate of death, debt, sorry, consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having what? Nailed it to the cross. Why do I want to become a slave of Christ? 
because of what he did for me. It's a willful thing. Eternal redemption can come from him. When we talk about this idea of going back to the last point of him cleansing us, cleansing us means like starting over, doesn't it? It's like now we're back to square one, but in a good way. There's no, there's no burden anymore. There's no extra things I've got to worry about. It's like, okay, a fresh start. That's the idea with that cleansing. It happens like this. I think a good uh, way it's illustrated or spoken of is 2 Corinthians 7. Jesus did that to save us. Uh, 2 Corinthians 7 is actually talking to believers, I think, after they've been saved and and continually doing that. Because do we still need God's cleansing after salvation? For, we need God's cleansing, you could say judicially, if you want to use a big word, for salvation, right? We're condemned to hell, but we need God's cleansing in order to forgive us and get us right before God and go to heaven. But as a believer, we still fail. We still mess up. And we need His cleansing along the way. Not to get to heaven, but in order to Live free and clear while we're on earth, planet earth. So let, think of that when we come to this, 2 Corinthians 7, 9 through 11. Now, and this Paul speaking. Um, I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance, for you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. And then that's it. For behold, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you. What vindication, which means a freeing of yourselves. What indication, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong. In everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the matter. He's saying, you, you, okay, you didn't just have guilt like worldly sorrow and you're, you're sorry you got caught. You know, you have guilt because it affected others, and because it affected others, now it affects you, and so you, you woe is me, and you get into this guilt thing. No, you had sorrow, like you saw your sin as God sees it, and you hated it like he does, and because of that, you had a sorrow that led you to want to get right with God. In other words, repentance, saying, yes, what I did was wrong. And after you got to that point, you repented. And then because you repented and said yes and agreed with God that what you did was wrong, then God freed you. What vindication, it's a word we don't use too much, right? But it's talking about that freeing. You know, God wants us to live free as Christians. And a lot of times we live weighted down by sin, even as believers. We wonder why our lives are sometimes screwed up or why our thoughts towards our lives are negative. A lot of times it's because we're still living with a burden of sin. We haven't truly got vindicated even as believers along the way. We let the sin build up in our lives and, we, and it trips us up. So, Why does it matter? Why have a clear conscience? Because if I have a clear conscience, I'm going to be able to serve God better. And because God loves me so much, that should be my goal while I'm on planet Earth. God didn't just save me and then say, okay, now that you're saved, come to heaven. Now, some of us say, I wish that had happened. Because then I wouldn't have failed this much after I got saved. (laughs) Or then I wouldn't have to deal with my spouse anymore. I wouldn't have to deal with my neighbor, my children, my parents, whatever. But that isn't the way God works. In fact, in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 is the salvation verses we use, but in 2, 8, 10, it says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works, which God prepared ahead of time. In other words, he has a plan for my life. That's a good thing when you know it's a good God who loves you and cares about you. We're going to go through um, kind of quickly here. Um, 
We talked about the reality of what Christ did. That's what we've just been talking about. But some of the results, because look at verse 15. It says, for this reason. So, in other words, for this reason. Now, what we just talked about, Jesus being the one who appeared as high priest and through the and now is um, come once and for all and made a sacrifice and cleared you from a, uh, your conscience. For this reason... We're just gonna, I'm going to read it, and I'm just going to mention some mentions of it for lack of time. For this reason, he is a mediator of a new covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgression that were committed under the first covenant, receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. For a covenant is valid only when men are dead, for it is never enforced while the one who made it lives. Therefore, even as the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood, for when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats and the water and scarlet wool and the hyssop and the sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. And in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with the blood according to the law. One may almost say all things are cleansed by the blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Now, a lot of you say, what in the world did you just read? Well, we're not going to spend a lot of time, but I'm going to just point out, pick out some few things. Jesus alone is our mediator. Did you catch that? That's in that first verse in verse 15. Jesus, he is the mediator of the new covenant, new contract, new um, will. Um, so he is alone as our mediator. There is none other. Second uh, Timothy, First Timothy two five. There is only one mediator between man and God. Who is it? The man, Christ Jesus. There is only one. The second thing we'll look, at, want to mention is this: the covenant is only valid because of Jesus' death and the shedding of blood. So this makes a little more sense. So the word that's used for covenant can be translated two ways. Will or covenant. Another word for covenant is testament. Ever heard people say, my last what? Will and testament. When does the will become useful? <laughs> when the other person died, right? You know, may think of some of us probably maybe need to be getting on that will thing. You know, as we get older, I know I think of it myself as I helped with my parents and in-laws and, and with theirs and it's like oh my I'm getting up that age I better I should have a will too I could die any moment right the young man who the, not young man but the man who died yesterday might have been in his early 60s and I'm getting closer to that myself I know I don't look at you know I look like I'm in my 30s but you know I am 49 so I'm, I'm almost on that 50 mark but <laughs> yeah, you're with me there <laughs> And some of you are way beyond me, <clears throat> like Carl Elks in the back, way beyond. <laughs> so anyway, so but, but I thought that was very interesting, right? So that the covenant, the new covenant, even in the word itself, couldn't happen until what? Jesus was the one who brought in the new covenant, but the new covenant couldn't take place until what happened? Jesus died. I thought that was just kind of interesting. I mean, we've been reading it, but even in the word itself, it's like, it's, it's his will. It's his, it's his testament. So Jesus, uh, the covenant became valid when Jesus died. Also, you see that there's no need to continue to sprinkle the blood over the book, the people in the tabernacle. That was happening all the time. And you may say, well, that doesn't sound very clear. Can you imagine if I took this blood and took like a paintbrush in it and I just started going like this? You're glad I'm not going that step further, aren't you? Somebody else is too, because they'd have to clean. But that's what would happen. Talk about a bloody religion, right? If they were thinking that everything would get, people would get sprinkled with blood, the, they would sprinkle blood over all the articles in the temple, right? They, that was everywhere. And that was to purify. And you're thinking, how in the world did that purify? That makes a mess and it's going to stink after. But it was an illustration, right? And tell, tell me this. If I started doing this with this blood right now, would that be a vivid illustration? Would you remember that? More than just walking out the door. So this summer, 
I made a mistake. Just whoever was at camp knows what I'm going to say next. So this summer, we were talking about the heart. So I bring in a cow heart. But I, and it was like this big around and that long. And so I thought, I'll get a heart, and I'll just put it in a big you know, pickles jar. The problem is I could not find a jar that would fit this heart. So then I'm like, okay, what am I going to do, right? Like, so I thought it would be simple, right? I put it in a jar, maybe put some uh, vinegar in it or something, and, and that would have been simple and clean and would have fit our culture very well today. I don't like to fit our culture very well, I guess. So I put it in a bag because it wouldn't fit in a jar, and I brought it in, but then I can't leave it in the bag because that isn't visual, right? If I leave that heart in a bag, is that going to really show anything? So I take it out of the bag. Well, that's okay. And I start wiggling it like this. And honestly, honest, I, you know, I'm not lying. I did not know that blood was coming out the other side. And the lady, young lady in the first row, <laughs> so like this, you know, and she didn't have pants on. I think it was shorts and sandals. Um, so I didn't realize that when I was like talking, I was going like this. I didn't know blood was coming out the other side. She thought that I knew it and was doing it on purpose. So she didn't say it because I said, why didn't you say something? So she had a few spots on her, and then the, I looked down, the whole floor had blood spots everywhere, didn't it? <laughs> Anyways, do you think that that girl forgot that the next week? How long do you think she'll remember that? <laughs> okay, <Glad> ne- <laughs> traumatized <laughs> she was. So the way she reacted, instead of screaming, she went... And she totally froze, like traumatized that way. I didn't know what, and then all of a sudden I caught it, and I went, oh, sorry, and put it back in the bag. And then I looked down, and I went, oh, my, it's worse than that. Yeah, okay, sorry about that. That little drop of blood on your toe. Really, it should be okay. But anyways. So you get the point, though, right? That would, re- you, that would stay with you, wouldn't it? That need for a cleansing would stay with you forever. And you would remember that something had to die and its blood had to be shed so that you could be right before God. Sometimes we get too clean. And so it's so easy for us to forget what Christ has done for us. Because we're too proper. We're too safe. I'm not going to start throwing the blood. That would for sure take us out of the safe part. And you would remember. But that's why I brought it in. Hopefully you'll remember that blood. Because it was shed for your sin. It was shed for mine. But there's no need to sprinkle the blood anymore. Because Christ shed blood. That one time offer paid the penalty that was needed for your sin and mine. And that's why it comes to verse 22. And according to the law, one may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It had to happen. They got it. Leviticus 17.11 talks about it. Real good verse about it. Even if you don't like, when you think of Leviticus, it scares you to death. 17.11 is one worth reading. Christ shed blood. With Christ shed blood, there is forgiveness. And then if you go on 23 to 26, it says he put away sin. He put away sin. But let's look at 27 and 28 to close up with, though. We said the reality, the results, now the rewards. 27, 20. And inasmuch as is appointed to men once to die, and after this a judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. The first reward that we have is when we accept that Christ died on the cross for my sin. You'd have to say my sin also. Not George's sin, but yours. You get it? Then you have the reward of salvation you have the reward of forgiveness of sin for eternity 
You have the reward of being saved from the penalty. In fact, Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, right? The second reward that he refers to here, so that's the first one, that's the most important. And that's what Christ was trying to show them when he came to earth the first time. He was like, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. But he, they didn't get it that they needed to be saved first from their sin before they could be saved then from Rome, to be specific, but saved from what's on this earth, the consequences and the penalties of sin, which would be domination by Rome for them. So that's the first, and that's what he came for the first time. But look at this. The second time, he will appear without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. Next time, he will come, and he will condemn sin as a whole, right? He took on sin on himself at the cross. But next time he comes, he will come not to save you from your sin, but to save you from the effects that sin has had on this world and on you. And he will take you home. Those of you who eagerly await him, he will take you. And then the sin will not affect you ever again. We don't even know what that would look like, right? What would it be like to live with a sinless spouse? <laughs> That was almost too loud, wasn't it, Terry? <laughs> All right, so conclusion. Jesus' blood matters, because without it, I am condemned. But with it, I am set free. So, just a little application here. Stop complaining. Stop blaming others. Stop feeling sorry for yourself. Stop withholding forgiveness. Stop thinking you're all you need. Stop using others. And stop condemning others. Are those specific to our message? No. Those are just a few ways that we should respond because of what Jesus' blood has done for us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Even through kind of maybe tough passages like this, we have a lot of them in Hebrews. I just pray, Lord, that you will help us to remember, even this morning, the visual of the blood and remember how your blood perfect, holy, without blemish, was shed for our sin. And that if we say, yes, it was shed for mine, I am a sinner, I need forgiveness, and Jesus' blood only can forgive me, that we can be saved. Saved from the consequences of our sin. Saved from what we deserve because of our sin, which is separation from God for eternity and have life with you for eternity instead. Lord, help us to remember that. And remember that your blood was final. There's no need for another sacrifice. You are the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through you. May that help us to be saved, but then, Lord, may that help us to live free as a believer in a way that just shows the world something that they don't have. So they want you because they see you through us. In Jesus' name, amen.